The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this California Nevada Dry and Climate Outlook. Um, this outlook is in, re in replacement of the normal January 28th webinar that we host in California, Nevada. Um, the last webinar was canceled in lieu of the government shutdown and not being able to get speakers and everyone together in time to do the webinar right after the shutdown. Um, so today we're offering this abbreviated, shorter version of the webinar with just the climate, drought and climate update and drought and climate outlook. Um, to still get inf important information out to the region. Um, before we get started, I just want to briefly again mention what NIDIS is. NIDIS is the National Integrated Drought Information System. Uh, we have an interagency mandate to create a national drought early warning system. So we've been building through these regional drought early warning systems and activities on prediction and forecasting, integrated research and monitoring, drought planning and preparedness, collaboration with existing partners and programs, and the drought portal, which is drought.gov. This webinar is hosted for the California Nevada Drought Early Warning System, and a drought early warning system utilizes new and existing partner networks to make climate and drought science and then impact data more readily available, easily understandable, and usable for decision making. Um, just a few announcements before we get started with our speakers. Um, so typically, these are things like events or other things of interest to the listeners. On March 29th, there'll be a workshop on data and tools for weathering Nevada's variable climate. It's going to be held at the University of Reno, and it'll be an interactive workshop. Um, space is limited, but you can register at the site here um, on the short link I put in here or email me for more information. And also just an announcement that a um, the National Drought Mitigation Center in January 2019 switched to a streamlined method for reporting local local and um, reporting local drought condition and is working with state agencies and other partners across the country to promote that form. And we recommend checking it out at the drought um, at the National Drought Mitigation Center's website. And then F with that, I'll pass it on to our first speaker. He's Jordan Goodrich from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. We'll give the drought and climate update. He's also a member of CNAP, the California Nevada Applications Program, the NOAA RISA team. And go ahead, Jordan. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Um, right again, so I'm going to uh, give a somewhat abbreviated version of the um, climate update uh, and then pass along to Amanda again for the. Uh, for the outlook on what's to come. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, I thought I'd start with the um, sort of current conditions from the US Drought Monitor to have a look at where we stand now. Um, and what we see for the California Nevada region is um, a, a couple of regions where we do have sort of mon moderate drought conditions sustaining, so this is uh, isolated mainly on Southern California along the coast, as well as sort of um, Northern and Eastern Nevada. Um, but really what we're seeing is that much of this region uh, is now classified as either abnormally dry, which is not actually a drought category, or um, not, not classified under any um, sort of dry or drought classification. And that's sort of the white area you see here in the, in the Sierra Nevada and surrounding regions. Um, so good news in general for the region. Um, but if we go to the next slide, we can see how this picture has sort of developed over the last three months. And again, sort of what we've seen in the last uh, month or so, especially, um, is an improvement in drought classification for, for much of the California Nevada region with um, uh, large swaths of sort of central and southern California, especially being promoted uh, up one, one category, um, uh, sort of alleviating some of the drought. And even uh, a couple of isolated regions where drought classification has improved by two classes. And really, the only area that has been downgraded over the last three months uh, to a more uh, more serious drought condition is sort of central Nevada area. And we'll see why in a minute. Um, so if we take a look at the actual um, precipitation data, this is from, these two maps are from the regional climate centers. 
And the first one here on the left shows the percent of normal precipitation over the last three months. So not exactly the water year to date, but um, pretty close. It starts on uh, October 7th here. Um, and again, what we see uh, is that much of the region in California, Nevada is either approaching or exceeding normal conditions relative to the long-term average. And so that's sort of um, orange and yellows uh, in around sort of 80 to 90% of normal. And then much of the sort of Southern uh, and coastal regions of California in particular are either at or above, or in some cases even well above normal for this, uh, this point in the, in the water year. Um, and if we take a look at the, the panel on the um, on the right, this is same map, but now generated just for the last 30 days. So January 5th to the um, February 3rd. And this is where we see that um, really much of the much of the precipitation for California Nevada has, has come in the last month or so. And this is sort of highlighted by a lot of the blues and purples you see in the sort of Northern California stretching into uh, Western Nevada to the North, as well as uh, in the South, um, lots of purples and blues there with some of the recent storms that have been moving through. Um, but here's where you kind of see why we're, we're seeing that um, drought classification remaining in sort of central Nevada, where it's it's still been uh, quite dry relative to relative to normal conditions. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to kind of take a step back and look at the precipitation data a little differently. So now here we're looking at um, rain gauge data. These are observations for the Western U.S. that are uh, compiled and made available by Dave Pierce here at Scripps. Um, and one of the things I wanted to kind of point out here is we see the uh, a sort of similar distribution, but now these dots uh, for each rain gauge are, are colored based on the deciles for uh, precipitation. So brown and, and sort of tan being drier, um, greens uh, being wetter. So what this kind of resembles, is starting to resemble, uh, is what we would consider a sort of typical El Nino pattern, where, in other words, uh, we have wetter conditions to the south and drier to the north in the uh, sort of across the west. But there's still sort of some mixed conditions, um, especially in sort of the central central regions. And so I'll talk a little bit more about this in a, in a few slides when we get into ENSO conditions. But um, the, other, the other panel here is uh, yet another view of precipitation. I wanted to kind of give a more of a, a time series viewpoint so that we can see uh, how this precipitation has developed. So I'm using here an example uh, for the Sierra Nevada 8 station index. And again, this is data that's compiled and, and made available by Dave Pierce here at Scripps uh, with the sources there below if you want to check this out, which are updated very regularly. Um, and so here we're seeing this sort of important hydrological indicator, this 8 station index, at uh, almost bang on the, the median long term for this point in the water year. Um, and so if you look at the bottom, portion, this is where you can really see that um, we had a, a kind of a dry start to the water year with October, November being pretty, um, pretty dry. But if you, if you focus in on January, this is where you see that um, the impact of these recent storms that we've, that we've been experiencing, bringing that uh, cumulative total up toward um, the long-term normal for the, for the water year. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, um, I just want to take a second to, to look at temperature now. Um, so these are set up the same way as the previous precipitation maps. Uh, the difference being here that these are presented as departures from long-term normal rather than percent. So these are um, temperature anomalies for the region, uh, again, from the regional climate centers. Um, and so if we Again, take a look at the, the left-hand panel. This is uh, last um, 
last three months. And we can see particularly California, but also stretching into Nevada, where we've been seeing um, particularly warm conditions. In some cases, uh, several degrees up to about five degrees warmer than normal, um, especially in sort of central California and Central Valley area. Um, but then again, if you if you move over to the right panel, this is the last 30 days, uh, much you see much larger anomalies uh, where it's been, um, although it's been wetter for the last month, it's also been quite a bit warmer than normal. So anomalies reaching up to eight or nine degrees above the long-term normal. And again, especially in that sort of central Nevada region, which is sort of the other part of that story on why that drop classification there has has increased. Um, so yeah, in general, sort of a, a quiet start to the water year, but the past month or so has been quite wet, but also quite warm. So if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll start to take a look at how this has impacted water resources for the region. Um, and so this uh, set of figures is compiled by Mike Duttenter at USGS, who's a partner uh, with us uh, here at CNAP. Um, and this figure is the classic Dettinger figure showing the combination of reservoir storage and snowpack and how that relates to the long-term normal uh, for, for both uh, reservoirs and then adding reservoir and snowpack as a kind of metric for, for water resources for the region. Um, and again, here, so despite the, despite the warmth over the past month, the, the sort of close to normal precipitation that we've been seeing has allowed storage and reservoirs and snowpack to, to climb up toward um, the long-term average for this point in the water year. And so um, both with, with respect to reservoir storage, that's this red line here, tracking near normal for the, uh, for the region and with snowpack, Again, climbing uh, pretty steeply in the last uh, last month or so uh, to climb up toward about fifty percent. Uh, sorry, sorry, the yeah, the median for the long term long term average. Um, so that's good news. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a similar figure, but now broken down into the northern, central, and southern regions of the Sierra and just looking at snow water content. And so this is where we see, uh, regardless of which region we're looking at, um, snowpack has uh, been climbing steadily and now at, at normal levels. And statewide, snowpack is about 105% of normal for this point in the water year, um, which is good news for uh, resources later on in the year when we start to see this coming out in um, uh, snowmelt stream flow. So speaking of stream flow, the, the next slide, I just wanted to first have a look at one reservoir in particular. Um, so here on the left, this is um, reservoir status for Lake Tahoe, which is a major water resource for sort of northern Nevada. Uh, just to give a sense of where where this stands, so right now Lake Tahoe is actually a couple feet above uh, what would be considered full. And again, this is this is thanks to some recent storms that we've seen come through in the last 30 days. Um, and on the right here, I wanted to give sort of a one view of stream flow uh, for the California Nevada region. Uh, these data come from uh, USGS, where you can go and select different time periods or or isolate different um, percentiles. So here, what I've highlighted are only those stream flow gauges that are classified at, in some kind of drought category. So that would be uh, the 24th percentile and below of the long-term normal for the seven-day stream flow. Um, and the reason for this is to basically highlight how few of these there are in the region. So uh, we see a few in sort of Southern California, uh, maybe a handful in the north, but really the, the story here is that most of these gauges are uh, above what we would consider uh, some kind of drought 
class. <clears throat> okay, so if we go on to the letter. So yeah, the, so this is the final final point I wanted to make here is if we take a look, uh, sort of zoom out and have a look at the end sub conditions. Um, these are the sea surface temperature anomalies um, from NOAA, which give an indication of how El Nino has been developing uh, this season. And so what we're seeing is if we look at the sort of tropical Pacific region, which is where we're concerned with um, these above average uh, temperature anomalies developing, what we've seen for the last couple of months and sustained currently are fairly weak uh, to even neutral sea surface temperatures. Um, uh, so in, this would be sort of classified as a, a weak El Nino to, to neutral. Um, and so this is where um, that sort of precipitation pattern for the West comes in. Um, we do see it translating a little bit to what we'd expect to see across the West in terms of pre precipitation. But um, the fairly weak development of El Nino and also the sort of lack of atmospheric coupling we're not seeing the atmosphere respond as strongly as you might expect. And so this isn't uh, translating into the sort of strong El Nino signal that you would expect for, for a strong year uh, across the West. Um, uh, but we're sort of monitoring this closely because the, the rest of the water year and the season is really going to depend on uh, whether this sort of sustains here and, and fizzles out, or this may sort of go the other direction. Uh, and the response in terms of um, sort of precipitation and regional hydrology will really depend on how this develops the next uh, month or two. And I think um, Amanda will probably touch on the, the outlook for the ENSO conditions uh, a little bit. So I'll turn it over to her to take it away from there. All right, thanks, Jordan. Um, as you mentioned, I'm going to be doing the outlook portion of the presentation. Um, here, you'll just see the monthly drought outlook, which just which just came out last uh, week on January 31st. I'll go into this in more detail in the coming pages, but as you can see, reflecting what Jordan was saying with the um, improvement in drought conditions and not and having more areas of either no drought or abnormally dry conditions leaves us only with fewer air parts of the area that we need to be concern, concerned with for, as of right now, whether their forecasting drought will um, occur or not later on. Um, so before I, I get started and look at more of the computer modeled forecasts and outlooks that are coming up, I first wanted to show a tool um, that basically instead uses um, historical observations of precipitation and then bases um, and then forecasts or sorry, not forecast, looks at the odds of a water year being 50%, 75%, 100%, 125%, or 150% of normal. So this is not based on a computer forecast model, but instead historically observed events um, and whether um, the odds lend us to have to reach a certain amount of normal following that. And this comes from CW3E um, here at Scripps and is created again by Mike Dettinger from US. GS. Um, so obviously we've had a pretty wet year, year so far this year. So using the observed data and um, historic what, what has happened before, um, right now the odds of normal for 50 and 25% are pretty good. Um, we're doing pretty well in the regions. There are a few spots here where there's not quite as high amounts. Um, and then when you get to this 100% of normal, um, you still see quite a few red. So these are those 20 to 30% odds of um, reaching 100% normal using the historical record. Um, and so while we're doing pretty well so far, we still have quite a couple of months to go along the way. And so I wanted to show this as one of the one of the ways of looking at of what's happened historically before, um, given this time of, of the year and how much precipitation we've gotten so far. And then just this, this just reiterates what jo um, what Jordan was showing about El Nino. Um, first, I'm going to go through El Nino, then I'll go through the different forecasts that the Climate Prediction Center and others have. Um, this is just down, if you look at this lower part, um, each box of these are the different parts of the seasons per year. And in the reds are going to be El Nino episodes and blues are La Nina episodes. 
And so as we've been going through the end of last year and still going into this year, currently the El Nino status, status is still sitting in a, a neutral phase. Um, to, to dig in this a little more, these are maps to sort of track this with time. And basically still since mid-December, um, positive SST anomalies have um, been occurring in the El Nino area of the Pacific Ocean that we look at. Um, but they have weakened. But during the last four weeks, they are still... Um, above average across the Pacific Ocean. And so given that information, um, the climate scientists at CPC in Colombia have released, this is their figure that um, forecasts the odds of La Nina neutral El Nino occurring um, by season. So here we are at DJF, December, January, February, January, February, March, February, March, April going forward. Um, and so they still have odds um, above normal of, El Nino um, occurring, um, but does go with time, go down with time if El Nino doesn't occur. And so, just a quick summary: as we are sitting here, still in the neutral um, conditions, um, equatorial sea surface temperatures are above average. Um, but as Jordan mentioned, the patterns of convection and winds are mostly near average. Basically, we need the ocean to um, kick in the atmosphere, which then would kick in um, um, teleconnections and, and impacts to us from the El Nino. And so El Nino is still expected to form um, and continue through the, our um, spring, about 65% chance, what they're saying right now. And so, as Jordan mentioned, we'll keep following this closely. Um, and I was thinking about this, I was like, well, what if El Nino does form? What does that mean for us? And as the monthly drought outlook came out, um, it answered some of the questions that I had about that. Um, as I said, there's some areas here that are sitting into, think drought. they think drought will, will persist in these sort of areas over the next month and drought removal um, potentially likely in these lower areas, partly due to the, to the precipitation we've received in February so far and will continue to receive in February. Um, but they did talk about ENSO and El Nino in there, and they talked about how given the timing and the weak event that is forecast, the weak El Nino that's forecasted, um, they're not going to expect significant global impacts um, during the rest of winter, even if El Nino does form. Not that it won't have an impact, but they're – as of right now, they don't think it's going to be significant. And just to go through the outlooks and forecasts, I'm going to short, start with the more of the weather time scale precipitation forecasts. Um, so this is a tool by CW3E, the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. Um, it looks basically of how much moisture is in the atmosphere but going back with time and where it's going to hit on the western coast of the U.S. So if you would have seen this map a few days ago before we, the recent rains, you would have seen these dark blue purple colors all over this sort of area of the region, meaning that that um, large amounts of water vapor were coming towards us in the region. Um, and basically they created this tool to look at atmospheric rivers, which are those plumes of moisture that hit our coast and cause storms and rain and our, build our snowpack and things like that. And so as you see right now, we don't have some of these larger plumes of moisture right now. There is some forecasted here, about, um, I think that's seven to 10 days out. Um, and this is the 8 to 14 day forecast from the Climate Prediction Center. They have a chance of above uh, normal um, conditions as well. And so I suggest you keep an eye on your local weather service office and what forecast they are providing. Um, but currently it's looking at least for Southern California, some favorableness of some um, upcoming weather in the next few weeks. And then to look on the seasonal outlook, this is the February, March, April temperature outlook. These are created by the Center um, for, for uh, CPC. And um, before I go into some of the different seasonal ones, I like to remind folks how to read these maps. Um, so basically, the, the color that's coded is the dominant category forecasted. So, in, for example, here in Reno, this dark orange color means they are forecasting above 53% chance of above normal conditions of high or higher than normal temperatures occurring there. It doesn't mean that the other conditions aren't possible. Um, that's still a 33% chance we'll have normal temperatures, 14% chance we'll have below normal temperatures. Um, but the, the favored category here is above normal. And that's true across most of the Western area, especially this higher, more likely even here in the Pacific Northwest than us. Um, and Los Angeles has slightly lower odds of above normal um, temperatures. So that was for February, March, and April. If we, You'll see this continues all the way through the spring and into the early summer. So March, April, May, we still have a forecasted above normal temperatures. March, April, June, um, same, above forecasted above normal temperatures. 
Similarly, here's precip's version. And so here, this brown means um, the high, the favored category is below normal pre precipitation. But it's still possible that we do have some odds of normal or above normal precipitation. But for February, March, and April, CPC is showing equal chances in our region, so equal chances of above, below, or normal temp uh, uh, precipitation. And then in the high, in the more northern parts, potential for below normal precipitation. And as you move through the spring, this pattern stays pretty similar um, until March, April, June, where um, it becomes equal changes over our whole area, and we start to move out of our wet season anyways, um, but we start to lose less information the further out we go. And so in summary, um, ENSO neutral conditions are still present. El Nino is still expected to form. There's a 68% chance. However, CPC in the recent monthly drought outlook um, suggested that significant global impacts are not anticipated even if El Nino does form. Um, the monthly drought outlook does show drought removal likely in Southern California, Nevada, um, and we're seeing some, going to likely see some of that from the rain we've already received this month in February. And the seasonal outlooks show above normal temperatures across the West with the higher odds further North and equal chances to below normal precipitation over California, Nevada um, for the more seasonal forecast going forward. And so with that, I'll wrap up. Um, thank you for listening today. This will be posted on the CNAP website, drought.gov, and the drought.gov YouTube page. Um, our next webinar, we'll go back into our regular schedules, which are every two months, is March 25th. If you go to drought.gov, you can sign up now and click on the calendar and sign up for the next webinar. Um, also, you can find contact me if you have any questions about this presentation or about the, the update or outlook, and you can find us on social media um, as well. Uh, so thank you for listening and hope you found this information useful.